So we're getting now to a new study, judges. And of course, uh, this could take a lot of nights. We've only got three, so we're not going to be getting too far into it. I'm sorry if I'm disappointing you if you think I'm going to do Samson. I'm not doing Samson in this small series here of, of judges. Um, it's just happened to be a quite effective slide to use as the, uh, the home slide, if you like, of the study. Um, but what we do want to do is, uh, is just explore a little bit of the, the background of the judges tonight, just to have a little look at what lessons we can gain from the book of Judges. Um, I think if you're like me, you'll probably have fond memories of going through the Sunday school era when it was the judges era. I don't think that's this year. I think it's next year. When I say next year, I think I'm talking about starting September next year, that stage of notes. They were exciting. That was an exciting era to do the judges. And it was exciting because a lot of our favourite characters come from the judges. You know, Gideon, Samson, of course, we all loved. And of course, you've got uh, some of the other uh, judges that, uh, that we know as well, Samuel being the last judge uh, mentioned in Scripture. Um, also in the book of Judges, we have uh, one of the most baffling events that has uh, stirred up the brotherhood for the last 170 years. It's all found in the book of Judges. Did Jephthah literally sacrifice his daughter or didn't he? You know, it's, there's, there's been conjecture about how we answer that. Uh, so that's all found in the book of Judges. Also, and we won't be dealing with this tonight, but there are some of the most harrowing and challenging events happen in the book of Judges. And I'm not talking about the judges themselves and what they went through and what the condition of the people were like around those, those particular judges, around the time of those judges, but I'm talking of the last five chapters of Judges. Uh, so the book of Judges is not boring by any stretch of the imagination. It is very fast paced, it's exciting, it's incredibly interesting. It has a wonderful message for us today. So let's get stuck into it. Let's just have a little look at some chapter uh, breakups of the uh, simple, very simple chapter breakups, only three of them I'm going to give you, uh, about the book of, uh, of Judges. We could, have, we could break it up a lot more small if we wanted to, but let's, let's just have a look here as we go through. First of all, chapters one from verse one right through to three verse six, the failure of the first generation. That paves the way for the book of Judges, for what the era was like, all stems back to the first three chapters up to verse six of, of the book of Judges. Quite incredible really when you have a look at what went wrong right at the go get, at the get, uh, get go, is that the word, or go get, whatever it is, right at that very beginning, it really goes wrong for Israel. And of course, uh, the, uh, the next lot of uh, chapters there from verse 7 of chapter 3 right through to verse 31 of chapter 16, we again always see the salvation, the long-suffering salvation of our God stepping in to save his people. Now, the last five chapters, we have labelled them the confusion of a depraved people. It's quite interesting when you get to these chapters, brothers and sisters, because they're not in chronological order. Uh, if you want to know the chronological order of, of Judges, that's what you've got to do. You've got to put it like that. So the last five chapters of, of, uh, of Judges actually really should go in straight after verse 6 of chapter 3. So we got the first instance of where the people go wrong. We then have this ex ex a terrible explosion of of depravity and, and the conditions of Israel starts off with a family that brings idolatry into the family and that spreads to a tribe, tribe of Dan, that depravity, that uh, uh, idolatry. And in the end, it explodes into this most incredible era of violence, one of the most incredible eras of violence in, in Israel's history where it talks about a harlot, it, it talks about uh, um, uh, alternative lifestyles. I don't need to spell that out, what that means. It talks about the highlights that people were prepared to go to, to make a point of taking a woman, cutting her up into 12 pieces, putting her into prepaid postal bags, sending them out into all places of Israel. That's all in Judges, just to make a point. And then it talks about vengeance, on, on a scale that we just cannot even begin to imagine. It almost wipes out a complete tribe, tribe of Benjamin. It almost gets wiped out. 
if it wasn't for the intervention of God. That's how bad things had become in the era of the judges. But just remember the chronological way in which the judges is actually, is actually put. So the, the time period of the judges, this is very interesting. It's open to conjecture. Uh, the actual period of the judges and the actual dates can be a little tricky to, to really highlight. Um, I've just given a suggestion here uh, that we probably could say is close enough. There's another one I'm going to show you in a minute that throws a little bit more light on it. Uh, we do have some clues as to how long the period of the judges lasted for. Uh, but there is one quote in Acts 13 that often throws us completely. So let's just have a look first of all as we would break up the chronology of when the judges period actually happened. So we start with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We then got the exile in Egypt, the uh, Israel in Egypt, then they leave Egypt under Moses and then eventually Joshua. Then you've got the period of the judges and then after that of course starts the era of the kings. Now when you come to Acts 13 and you read uh, these words in Acts 13, you can be forgiven for saying, oh well there you go, the period of the judges lasted for 450 years. Well it's not quite correct. So Acts 13, and we read from verse 17. And this is Paul speaking and he's, he's about to give a dissertation on the history of Israel and he says in verse 17, The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt and with an high arm brought them here out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he the man, their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet, Samuel being the last judge. So all of a sudden you read that, you'd be forgiven for saying, well there you go, the period of the judges lasted 450 years. You can't get 450 years when you look at all the judges, you look at all the times that they suffered under the nations, you look at all the times that they were given peace, it's a very difficult thing to do to stretch that out to 450 years. Most people say it was around the 300 year mark. Well that verse in verse 20 of Acts 13 is not quite written the way it's meant to be written in the original. Let me put it on the screen how it should be written. Uh, it says this. Well, first of all, I'll put some dates up here for you. So we're talking there of, uh, we're suggesting that you know, the judges' era started around 1340, 1350. I've half, made it halfway through to 1015. That may be slightly out as well, but it's pretty hard to get more than 300 years in the book of Judges. So, when you read Acts 13, verse 17, this is what it does say. And I won't read all this again. It's almost identical up until you get to the last part. Let's just read the bit there. It says, He distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. So when you read Acts chapter 7 and you read verse 20, it's not talking about the period of judges lasting 450 years. It's talking about the period from when they went down into Egypt right through to when the judges started. And you can actually see that's a 450 year period. And that matches up with what Stephen says in Acts chapter seven. So when you start putting all these things together, you start to realize the period of the judges was around about 300 years. We're not given the exact amount. Here's another uh, chronology of, of judges timeline. Uh, slightly different dates but nonetheless agreeing with the idea that there seems to be about a 300 year period on the book of Judges. What's interesting about that slide, and probably you can't see that from down the back, Darren, that writing's a bit small, correct? Yep. Okay, so what is interesting is what took place during the period of the Judges, the story of Ruth, took place during the period of the Judges, which I find quite fascinating. Because we know that God says in Deuteronomy, or that Moses says in Deuteronomy, the eyes of God are on his nation, his country, his people, nation of Israel, from January the 1st through to December 31st, to put it that way, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. 
God's eyes are on that people. And his eyes were focused upon a very difficult time period in Israel's history. And smack bang, right in the middle, not right in the middle, but earlier on in the period of the judges, in a very difficult time period, we have this beautiful story of Ruth and Naomi. It just happens to be in the book of Judges. And I think that family got out not just because of a famine, a physical famine that threatened their, their existence. I think they got out because they also saw a spiritual famine. And uh, Naomi, who was the, really the faithful one in that family initially, as we know, probably was not coping at all with what was going on in Israel at the time. So they went down to Moab. Yes, probably a mistake, but of course some great things came, out of, uh, came as a result of that, that particular move. And when they came back into the land, it was just Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth and, of course, that led to the, to the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Quite interesting, isn't it, how that God was going to bring those two events, the event of Naomi and Ruth, the event of what was going on back in Israel at the time of the judges, two, two oppositely opposed things, a very faithful small family, a terribly depraved ecclesia of God. He was going to bring those things together in the book of Judges, and, of course, it followed on with the, the story of Ruth. Quite, quite incredible what was going on during the book of, of Judges, that era. So what happened? Come back to Judges. Come back to the verse, first verse. And, and Jared, I apologise for having chosen that particular reading. Everyone's probably thinking, what did you choose that for? <laughs> what? How come all those names? Well, there's a reason for that. We'll get to that in a moment. I didn't want to start at the beginning because it would have made the chapter a little bit too long tonight. But there is the very first verse of Judges chapter 1 gives us a clue to where, how things are starting to go, go downhill. When leadership dies, now this is very important, when leadership dies, and we read in verse, uh, verse 1, now after the death of Joshua it came to pass. After the death of Joshua, it came to pass. You know what that really means, brothers and sisters and young people? Here's what it means. If you want to reread that, this is what it actually means. Here's what happened once Joshua died. So Joshua was a great leader of his people. Took over from Moses. A wonderful leader of his people. And here's what happens when he dies. And we're going to see what actually happened. It was dreadful. Everything went downhill. Now, we all know that the truth is bigger than one individual. You know, the, the truth is not about one individual. But this case here shows us that there was no other leaders in Israel once Joshua had gone. Caleb was still there, but he didn't probably last too much longer, and he's the only one in chapter 1 that really gets rid of the people out of the land. The rest of the people don't, as that's the reason why we chose this reading tonight, and we'll show you what went wrong. Um, but when you look at this, there were very few, apart from Caleb, there was no leaders in Israel. There was absolutely no leaders in Israel. Now that immediately spells out something very important for us in this age. You don't have to be a speaker to be a leader. Let's make that very clear. In fact, in my life, leadership, and I'm not talking about my life, but as far as I'm concerned in looking out at the ecclesia world, there are leaders in the ecclesia that don't ever step foot on the platform. They lead by example. They're not orators of the word. But they're people that I look to, that I admire, and that I think have absolutely done excellent work in the truth and have affected my life personally. In fact, it's, the opposite. it's quite op often that the quiet, consistent, unassuming brother or sister who is a wonderful leader in the ecclesia. You would know that. You've probably got someone in your mind now as we, we think about this particular subject. I'm very thankful to God that we've got people like that in this meeting. Every meeting has got those quiet, unassuming brethren and sisters who go about their work and the truth by coming to the meetings regularly, by being here, by doing their commi committing themselves to their duties, by doing all of those things. They may never even get up and do a reading from the platform. It doesn't matter. They're leaders. They are leaders in the ecclesia, brothers and sisters. I remember Brother Mike Hyman a few weeks ago, he gave a an exhortation where he, he said that a leader really is a caring shepherd. 
And once we stop being caring shepherds, then we're going to be in trouble like our brothers and sisters were in the times of judges. Because once they lost Joshua, things went terribly downhill very, very quickly. And we need to be very aware of leadership, which is leading by example. And that's very important, I think. I, I, I remember Uncle Purse, Pip, your granddad. I think it was 1987 he might have died, is that about right? Now, a lot of you people here wouldn't remember Uncle Purse, but there would be quite a number that would remember Uncle Purse Mansfield. And uh, uh, my age group only really ever saw him in his twilight years. Um, we didn't see him when he was in his prime, which was probably the 50s and early 60s, perhaps, and pops into the 70s. But we didn't see him in his prime. But I remember the day he died... And the following week or two, I wasn't, this Golden Grove wasn't in existence then, but there were people saying, what's going to happen to the truth now? How are we going to cope with our Uncle Purse? What's going to happen? That's how much of a leader figure he was. Yes, he was a speaker, he was a platform brother, he was a great orator, he wrote so many, so many books, but we, we tended to think, that's the end of the truth, it's gone, it's finished. It didn't happen, did it? Thankfully... There were other leaders in the meeting, not necessarily platform brethren, that took the, 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 uh, the mantle up and, and kept on going and made the truth as, as vibrant and as strong as it could be. And we did survive. And Uncle Purse has now been gone for 30 years. 30 years, I guess this year, he passed away. And we're still here. So leadership is extraordinarily important. Very important, and we need leaders in this meeting. We need more of them. We need, and that's again not talking about necessary speaking, we just need people committed to making the truth vibrant in their own personal lives and then spilling that over into the ecclesia because it's very, it, it's, it's very catchy, isn't it? It's contagious when you see that type of attitude, and it's fantastic if we can, if we can do that. So, um, beginnings, new beginnings often are punctuated by earthly end of God's servants. Uh, you consider this. Um, Exodus begins with the death of Joseph. So there was a completely new era about to start once Joseph died. Uh, Joshua, as we uh, already know, that man begins with the death of Moses. Judges begins with the death of Joshua. And Kings begins with the death of David. And every time someone like uh, that person, like a, a leader of the, the qualities of those people there that we've just spoke about, once they pass off the scene, it's a new era. Something amazing happens, sometimes good, sometimes very tragic, sometimes very bad. And of course, we don't know, we're not immune to tragedies in our life. We're not immune to things happening in our life where we, we totally have no control over. And here was a situation where the death of Joshua, the people had control over that. They could step up to the plate and make a real good go of it, but they didn't. And we're going to show you now from our reading what went wrong when there was lack of leadership. What went wrong after the death of Joshua? And chapter 1 is all about that. It's all about it because it goes on to talk about how the individual leaders of the tribes and the tribes themselves had been given their portion of land and what they needed to be doing with that portion of land, which was to drive out the enemy, to drive out the existing inhabitants. That's what they were meant to do. So when we get to Judges chapter 1, and again, Jared, you did a great job for reading it. There's a lot of names in there, I know. We need to always remember what God said to his people right from the word go. He said, never let the people, that's the people, the existing people in the land, never let them live in your land, or they will make you sin against me and they will trap you into serving their gods. Now that was the foundation number one rule that all the tribes had to lock up into their brains and had to teach to their kids, had to teach it to their families, the elders had to teach it to their various tribes and their tribal elders and so on. 
The number one rule was you cannot live alongside somebody that already is in that land because you will end up falling prey and they will trap you into serving their gods. So what happened after Joshua died? What was the catalyst that was the springboard into, into catapulting Israel into some of the darkest times of their ecclesial history? What was it? Well, it was listed in that reading tonight. They didn't live up to that fundamental number one principle, getting rid of those people out of the land. By the way, you might think, gee, that seems a bit harsh of God, doesn't it? You know, here was a people living in the land, Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Philistines, they were all living there. You know, they had the land there first and God comes along and he says, get rid of them all, drive them out of the land, you can't leave them there. And we might think to ourselves, that seems harsh. That seems very harsh to say and to do that. You only got to look in the history books and even in scripture itself and have a look at the quality of the people that were living in the land prior to Israel coming along and you will see and understand why God did not want them there. They were absolutely dreadful in every sense of the word, right down to teaching their kids the most horrendous things that they could do as children. And God says, I do not want them in that land. I am going to call that my land. I want my people to go in there. And I do not want those people to stay there. Because if you leave them there, they will make you sin. They will trap you. That's what they're going to do. Well, of course, uh, they fail to do it. Just turn the page. The first one, we start in verse, uh, in verse 19 there. You will see the first ones there that didn't drive out the inhabitants uh, was, uh, was Judah. He drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but he couldn't drive out the inhabitants of the valley. So we've got a problem already. He just couldn't get them out. Notice the next verse, Caleb does though. He gets rid of the, the, the people, the influences in the area of land he's got. He gets rid of them. But then starts this, this, this repetitive points where the people that were in the land, the various tribes, did not drive the, the people out. And it starts off, of course, in verse 21, the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem and so on. So let's just put some of these up on the screen. Just have a look. So verse 27, Manasseh, that's not Manasseh the king. Of course, you all know that's the tribe of Manasseh. Manasseh the king hasn't even been born yet. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean. Now, we've already got an issue that's going to arise as a result of them not doing this. Now, the inhabitants of Beth Shean were the Philistines. Manasseh didn't get rid of them out of that particular area, out of that particular, became the, the city, Beth Shean. And as a result of them not driving out the inhabitants of Beth Shean, one of the most loveliest men of the Bible, with his father and his brothers, were nailed to the city walls, city gates of Beth Shean. Saul, Jonathan and his brothers, they nailed their headless bodies to the walls, to the gates of that particular city. Now, had the tribe of Manasseh done their job in the first place, we might never have had that incident. It would have happened somewhere. I'm sure God had it all under control. But it just goes to say, show, if you don't make a stand here, way down the track here, something terrible could happen. And it did. And we move on. Israel did not utterly drive them out, verse 28. Neither did Ephraim drive them out. Neither did Zebulun drive them out. Asher didn't drive out the Canaanites. They did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive them out. And we read that, and Jared read that for us time and time and time again. They completely forgot about Exodus 23. They got lazy. They started to say to themselves, you know what, they're not such bad people. We can live alongside of them. We'll keep them in control. We'll make them be tributaries. They'll have to pay us taxes. And as a result of that, they, they were trapped, just as God said they would become. They, become. they became trapped to the way of life of the people that were already in the land. Now, what's the lesson for us, brothers and sisters? Goodness me, it, it's quite amazing when you think about it, because we could look at that and say, whoa, boy, oh boy, did they make a biggest blunder. How crazy were they not taking note of what God actually said? Brothers and sisters... We don't have Philistines out there and Canaanites and Amorites. So I tell you where we do have them, they're all up in here. <laughs> do right, they're up in here. 
And out there, the influences of the world, they excite all of those influences in the mind and the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Philistines that are in our mind. They start to trap us into doing things that we shouldn't be doing. So we have to be extraordinarily careful, and we can't, this side of the kingdom, be perfect, but we have to be very, very careful that we don't entertain the idea that we can bring the world into the ecclesia, that we can live comfortably together, the world in our homes. And we've all given away a fair amount of that way of life that we used to live 20, 25 years ago to how we live it today. We, we have capitulated. Oh, it's no point in saying we haven't. We all have. We all do things today which we wouldn't have done 20 years ago, 15 years ago. We've given in. And we have to be very, very careful that we try to do our very best to fight that battle right to the very end. Sadly, they gave in. They didn't hardly fight any battles. In fact, uh, Dan, the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Dan were given that area of land for their for their area of, of occupation, was down in that particular region. They couldn't fight the battle. The battle was too hard. They, it was all too hard. The, 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 the Philistines on the coast are just too difficult for us. We want to go somewhere else. We don't even like this part of the ground anyway. It's just not as good as where we want to go. So they all packed up, you know, take a bat and ball and go home, didn't get their own way, couldn't fight the Philistines, couldn't, couldn't win the battle. So they all started marching up. And they heard that up north is beautiful, green and lush. And as they made their way up north, and you can read this in chapters um, 17 to 21, you find that Dan got mixed up with a little family. They got mixed up with a bad priest that was bringing in idolatry into the ecclesia. He was bringing in wrong doctrine. And the, the Dan became a tribe totally and absolutely divorced from the truth. They ended up right up there in the north because they didn't, Remember or take note of what God says. Don't bring these influences into your life. If you think that our spiritual mind will win the majority of battles over the carnal mind, then you must be living on another planet because we're biased to sin. You know what that means, brothers and sisters? You know what that means, young people? It means that our ability to sin is so much, much easier than it is to do the right things. The old bias on the side of the, uh, the indoor bowling ball, you know, the heavy weighted dot that when you, you roll the ball it says it's a bias dot and the curves around that way. And we are born into this world with human nature. We are curving always towards sin. And Uncle John used to say, your spiritual battle with your carnal mind, don't ever feel as though you're going to win that battle every time. Most times you won't. That doesn't mean we sit back and go, oh, that's, that's good, I feel good now because mostly I fail. We all fail. I think mostly we all do fail. But the point is this. If there's no battle going on, we have a real problem. Have you got a battle going on in your mind? Do you find that tomorrow when you get up and you go about your daily work that there's a battle going on in your mind? And there's a battle going on with the influences that we're involved in? Because if there's no battle and things are just really good and we're entertaining all of these lovely pleasures of life, then we have definitely lost the battle because there isn't one. If there's a battle going on in our mind and there's a warfare going on in our mind and we do lose probably more than we win, as long as that battle's happening, that's what God wants to see. So these people have lost the battle. They were giving God the leftovers. They couldn't care less anymore. They had all of these people in the land. That's all right. You can stay here. Just pay your taxes. Become a tributary. That's all right. No problems at all. Oh, look at what he's doing. Won't get involved in that. And within a short period of time, they're not only involved in it, they're encompassing it all. And it becomes a way of life for all of those brothers and sisters and their families in the ecclesia because they didn't get rid of these people out of their land. So we have a broken people. We have a very faithful God, though. He doesn't leave him in the lurch. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, that's mentioned twice in, in uh, Judges, in 17 verse 6 and 21 verse 25. But accompanying that is another statement. In those days, there was no king in Israel. In fact, that statement's mentioned four times in the book of Judges. Twice it's mentioned in conjunction with the divine summary. But that's equally as important. There was no king in Israel. Well, that's an irony because I understand there is a king in Israel. There was a king in Israel at that particular time. God. 
It was God. Now, here's the interesting scenario. We believe that Samuel wrote the book of Judges. Can you remember how Samuel felt when, when the people wanted a king that they could see? He felt as though it was a, a really, a, a, he felt badly let down as though the people didn't want him anymore as a judge. They didn't want Samuel anymore and, and, and he felt badly let down. And God said to him, Samuel, it's not about you, Samuel. It's me. They, they basically don't want me. And I have been their king right back here 300 years before Samuel. I was king right back there in the time of the judges when they first came into the land. You remember the Sunday school lessons? To have a kingdom, you had to have people. You had to have land. You had to have laws. And you had to have a king. And they had all of those things. They had the people, they had the land, they had the laws, and they had a king, which was God. Hence it became known as the kingdom of Israel, well before Saul ever came along. So really what this is actually telling us is that they had discarded God way before the time of Saul. It had started right back here in the beginning of the, of the year of the judges. They'd lost their passion to accept God as their leader, as their king, hundreds of years before Saul was born. And of course, uh, that started a lot of this particular issue of, uh, of them spiralling out of control and going downhill. Alrighty, so uh, the judges, what do we know about some of these judges? Well, what we do know is that every judge was different, quite different from each other. Um, they were quite special in their own right. Some of them that we know very well, and there's a, there's a lot of information about some of the judges. Some of the other judges we know very little about. There might be one or two verses. In fact, you know, Pippo used to love your studies on the nobodies that nobody knew. You could almost throw a couple of the judges in there because they'd mentioned once and there's one verse on them and yet they saved Israel. Well, God used them to save Israel out of a particular nasty circumstance that they were in. I like the fact that God chose different people. These were not all out of the same mould. Every judge from the obscure to the renowned was courageous, smart, relentless, passionate seekers of God. We know all that because God wouldn't have used them otherwise and his spirit came upon them, as the, as the book of Judges does say. But they're all different, like you and me are different. We're all different, brothers and sisters. I look at some brothers and sisters, I admire, I admire them greatly, but I, I say to myself, I, 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 can't, I just can't live like that. I don't know how they do that, how they're able to do those things in the truth. I, I wish I could. I, I can't live like that. But they're different. And sometimes, you know, you might look at me and say, well, I'm definitely not going to pattern my life on him. I don't blame you if you say that. We're all different, brothers and sisters. We look at each other and we do things differently. We say things differently. We, we are all different. We're not all of the same mould except for one thing. We hope, trust and pray we have the same driving influence and force in our life that all wants the same end result, and that is to help each other be in the kingdom of God. That's what these judges are like. They had, they had the same passion for God, but they did things in such a different way. It's quite amazing. And when you look at some of these judges, uh, they, were, they were most unconventional. Uh, some of them were very unconventional. Um, many of the judges, not conventional leaders. Now, for example, which judge, had, which judge had a violent temper? Samson. He had a violent temper, but God used him. Now, we all love Samson because there's so much about that man that is just, you know, it's, it's the heroic type deeds he did and it's the strength he had. And when you come through the Sunday school lessons, we all wanted to be like Samson, nice and strong and tough and, and vigorous and all of those things. He made some huge monumental errors, but he had his own different ways. Who was the son of a harlot? Jephthah. And, and he's, the, he's the character that we all struggle with. Did he or did he not sacrifice his daughter? So you can talk about that over supper if you want. <laughs> Who was the negligent ne or ne neglectful father? Eli. Eli neglected to bring his kids up properly. Samuel, while his kids didn't turn out right, it was probably more so that Eli was completely turned a blind eye 
to, uh, to his, his children's behaviour. And they weren't children in the sense of kids, they were adults. Oh, this one's pretty easy. Who was the female leader among men? Deborah, Deborah, however you want to say it. So every one of those judges are entirely different in how they react with each other, with the people and what they do in their life and, and how they went about their various day-to-day -day activities. They all had one focus, though, and that was a passion for God. But they all did things quite differently. They were all out of different moulds, so to speak, but God was able to use them very, very um, effectively. So here's the list of judges. Let's put them all on the screen. There was 14 of them all together. So we've got Othni, Ehud, Shamgar. Some of these you might never have heard of before. I must admit, I, there were some there I thought, well, who's that? I've never, ever, ever heard of them. Of course, we all know Deborah and Gideon, Tola, for example, Jer, Jephthah we know, Ibzan, Elon, Abdon, Samson, Eli, Samuel. All we do know is the Spirit of God came upon these people and they were able to work some incredible and amazing uh, um, events in Israel's history. All right, I'm going to leave you with this last slide. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. A little bit of conjecture about really what does that mean as far as where we are concerned today. Let's just put a few quotes on the screen here. Uh, we've got there's just there's quite a few quotes we could go to, but going back to Deuteronomy, don't worship me in how you think is right in your eyes, says God. Very important we do that. We just must understand that we don't worship God how we think we should do it through our eyes. No, it's always the eyes. It's what we see. Sometimes we see things and we think, oh, wow, that's fantastic. And we think we can incorporate that into our worship of God. God says, don't worship me in how you think is right in your eyes. Proverbs 21. Every man, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. But here's the key. God weighs the heart. He's looking at what's going on in here. Not really in here, but in here. He's looking at the motives. Don't be guided by your own heart and eyes that have been untrue to me. So if you haven't got that right, then you'll never get these right. Whatever you do, you be focused, absolutely 100% focused with your heart. That is your motivation to want to push for uh, worshipping me. That's, that's basically what he's saying. Now, I want you to think about that in the broad spectrum of, of, of ecclesias across the world. Every ecclesia is different. Every ecclesia is different. You do have some that are very conservative in our approach to the truth. And you also have some that are not so conservative. Uh, it, it are both right, both wrong, or is one right, one right and one's wrong? What's the word conservative mean? Where, does the, where do we draw the line with that, that word conservative? Is there a sliding scale? Is there a pendulum? What, what does it mean? You know, we often say, oh, somewhere in the middle is a balance. Well, brothers and sisters, just think about this. God is looking at the inward motivation. He's looking at the heart, and he's looking at the person that wants to worship him. And if that heart is in the right place and doctrinally Doctrinally, it is sound, good basis of the truth. No watering down of doctrines. No bringing in wrong doctrines, which is what happened here in the, in the time of the judges. None of that. Then God can accept both me measures of, of worship. Now you could say, well, uh, he accepted the, the, uh, the strict code of the priestly conduct of worship. That was a very conservative way of, of, of worshipping God. God. God accepted that. In fact, he ordained that. And at the other end of the scale, you might say, well, check out David when he was just totally overcome with wanting to worship God, bringing the ark back to, to, to uh, Israel after being in captivity for so long. And he's bringing the ark back and he's singing and he's dancing and he's doing all of these things which seem foreign to some people, especially his own wife. They stood back and went, oh, that seems different. And, and so all of a sudden you've got these two ways of worship but God accepted that as well now that doesn't mean we, we're going to come in here doing hallelujahs like all the churches we don't do that we, we we know that I'm not trying to say that at all but what I am trying to tell you brothers and sisters from the word of God is that God himself accepted both forms of that worship from the very ultra conservative way of of worshiping God under the under the ordained priestly code of conduct 
right through to he loved what, how David's heart was when he brought the ark back to Israel. Quite amazing, the enthusiasm, the passion that David was able to show. So God looks on the heart, all right, and he doesn't want us to really miss that point. Don't worship me in how you think's right in your eyes. Do it with your heart. And God will be the judge of our hearts at the judgment seat. Sadly, brothers and sisters, sadly, in the time of the judges, they had, their heart was like stone. They had no motivation to really want to worship God in the correct manner. And they gave God, as we said previously, the leftovers. Whatever was left over, we'll give to God. And unfortunately, therefore, they rebelled, they put wrong doctrine into the ecclesia, and they did what was to them acceptable in their own eyes. So it's just a little basis, if you like, of the book of Judges, how we start. Next week, we're going to look at a couple of minor judges. We'll have a little look at some more interesting information about the, the time period of the judges. Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to talk about it over, over supper. You can kick it off by talking about Jephthah if you want to. Uh, next class, of course, God willing, we're going to have a look at this quotation that Paul uses in Corinthians, that God's strength is made perfect in weakness. Goodness me, is that a fantastic little verse in scripture that is so evident in the time of the judges and we'll have a look at how God's strength was made perfect in weakness. It's quite fascinating. So look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks time. Thanks Lionel.